Good morning, everybody, and it's 10 o'clock. Welcome to today's webinar. It's our final webinar of the year, uh, more of which later. Um, and today we're going to be talking about 13 easy ways to repurpose your existing content to get more inquiries. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed we've changed something. It was going to be 10 easy ways, but I was right in this webinar. I came up with a few more. So you've got 13 easy ways. Um, usual time on a tradition, though, I'm going to hand over to Dan to explain how we do things, um, and then we'll dive into the content. Thank you. Um, three extra ones. Wow, that slightly softens the pain of it being the last one of the year, doesn't it? So there is that. Um, hi, I'm Dan. I'm the head of branding and design here at Yardstick. And as usual, I'll be keeping us on track and on time and fielding your questions and comments. So to do that, we've got two options. We've got the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen or the chat function. So take your pick. I'll be keeping an eye on both as we go along. And looking at the attendees list today, it's nice to spot plenty of familiar names. But for any newcomers among us, and there are a couple I can see, we operate a very safe space here in this little Zoom room together. There are no silly questions, I promise. So don't be scared to shout up if something doesn't make sense or you have any questions or anything like that. Um, the same applies, I mean, if your experience differs from what Phil is saying, you know, we like to hear opposing views. So whether you agree, disagree, simply don't understand, get those questions in, get the comments in, and let's have a, a good debate about this. So I'll be reading them out as we go. And at the end, we'll time permit and sweep any final questions up. So don't worry if we don't read yours out immediately. We'll sort of filter them through at appropriate times as we go. And as usual, a follow-up email and recording of this session will be sent out thanks to our very own Abby Robinson, who will be taking notes on any resources or assets Phil mentions. So for the final time of the year, over to Phil to tell us how we can repurpose content, save time, enjoy a slightly easier life, but more importantly, get more inquiries. Yes, Dan, thanks. Right, so uh, let's have a quick rundown of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to start by explaining seven reasons why you need to repurpose your content, because it isn't always obvious to a lot of people that we need to change the balance between content production and content promotion. And too often, the uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, uh, people believe that the, the finish line of the race has been reached when the content uh, has been produced. But frankly, it's only half the journey, maybe even, even less than half. We've got to keep uh, promoting it, repurposing it, reimagining really it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Talk about some of the barriers to uh, repurposing content. Um, then talk about how you choose which content you actually do repurpose. Do you repurpose and uh, reimagine blog A, B, or C? Uh, how do you choose which ones you should repurpose? Um, and then we're going to go into the meat of this with 13 pretty quick fire ways that are all easy, they're all practical ways you can turn your blogs into other content. So, as Dan says, please do leave your questions, comments in the chat or Q&A, uh, and we'll field those as we go through. Today is the last webinar of the year, so it would be good to get as many comments, as much feedback as possible. That would be really helpful. Um, and as Dan says, we don't have all the answers, um, and there are some excellent marketers on this call. Um, so if you've got uh, your own perspectives, your own points of view, please do share them with the group by putting them in the chat. So let's start with the reason why we're here. Why do you need to repurpose your content? Uh, repurpose is one of those interesting words. I kind of struggled whether to use it or not. I wondered if it was one of those rather wanky terms that marketers like to use. Um, and I couldn't think of an alternative. So we've stuck with it uh, for repurposing content. Um, but if anybody's got an alternative, really happy to hear it. Um, first reason. Um, is for me the most important. Um, producing content costs, takes time, and that time isn't free. Um, uh, if you outsource it to someone like us, you pay for our time, um, and your time isn't free. Um, you absolutely uh, need to be thinking what else you could be doing with that, with that time. 
So once you've invested the money and the time in producing the content, repurposing it maximizes your return on investment. And it's, it's so important that once you have that blog, that guide, whatever it is, that you squeeze as much value out of it as possible. Um, number two, um, it opens up, repurposing it, opens up your content to new audiences or new people joining your audience. So two examples of what I mean by that. Let's say, for example, um, you've got a couple of audiences. You've got your newsletter database um, and you've got your LinkedIn audience, your connections on LinkedIn. You publish a blog uh, on a Friday, as Yardstick do, goes out to the newsletter audience. Um, and you post about it maybe a couple of times on LinkedIn, but only a relatively small proportion of your LinkedIn audience will actually see the blog. Um, or if you don't post it on social um, and you just push it out in the newsletter, your LinkedIn audience in that example will never actually get to see it. So repurposing your content means you open up the content, the blog in this case, to just a wider audience. It's a bit like taking your show on the road. Uh, Peter Kay isn't doing uh, one location in the UK. Uh, whatever he's doing, he's doing lots of locations to take his, uh, his show on the road. And we need to be doing exactly the same with your blog content. Um, and also, we've got to remember that new people are joining your audiences all the time. Um, and if I publish, a, if you ask it, we publish our blog on Friday. Um, it's about getting more people to sign up to your newsletter. Um, and people who then sign up to our newsletter will become in our audience two, three, four, five weeks time. They're going to miss that content if we don't repurpose it and keep repromoting it. So repurposing your content opens it up to wider audiences, more audiences and new people joining your audience. Um, number three, this is probably not great for our business model, but repurposing your content, that uh, means that you have to produce less of it. If you are repurposing your content, um, doing different things with it, it means you need fewer source articles in the first place. Um, so number three, it reduces the amount of content you need to produce. Very good reason for repurposing your content. Number four, um, if we're talking about blogs, which we are doing later on when we've got the 13 ways to repurpose, one good thing we've got to remember is not everybody wants to read text-based content. Um, other people, other people might want to consume it in the form of, I don't know, a graphic or an infographic, a video, a podcast, a webinar. We all consume content in different ways. Um, and if we only give the content to people in one way, which is generally the way we prefer to produce it, you're kind of alienating some of your potential audience. So number four, not everyone wants text-based content. They want to consume it in different ways. Number five, and it's pretty obvious, the more you repurpose it, the more you repromote it, the more it increases the chances of people seeing your content. Um, Abby wrote a brilliant post a while ago, um, this, the data for which I nicked for a LinkedIn post recently, about the half-life of social media posts. Um, and the half-life of a social media post is simply the length of time it takes for it to have reached half your audience. Um, and it's a matter of seconds on Twitter. It's measured in hours on LinkedIn. Um, but if someone misses it the first time around because they didn't open your email that week, they weren't on LinkedIn for a period of time, they weren't on Twitter because they were on holiday, repurposing your content just increases the chances of people seeing it. And of course, takes us all back to point number one, it helps to increase our return on investment. Number six, if people don't see your content and don't engage with it, then it can get a bit, get incredibly frustrating. Um, that can lead to getting a bit downhearted. That can lead to producing less content. That can lead to you stopping producing content. So the more you repurpose, the more people who will see and engage your content and the more enthusiastic you will feel about the whole process, um, there is nothing worse, and we've all done it, um, there's nothing worse than putting out a social post that just dies 
Yeah. Um, nobody likes it. Nobody comments on it. Nobody reshares it. Or a blog that nobody reads. You spent hours producing. You thought it was great. You put it up and it just dies for whatever reason. Um, and that, as I say, can lead to just a lack of enthusiasm for the process of producing content. So the more you repurpose, the more people will see it. Um, and the more feedback, the more of your own dopamine hits you will get. And then number seven, help to satisfy the rule of seven. So the rule of seven simply states um, that someone needs to um, have engaged with you or be touched by you at least seven times before they take a call to action. I suspect in this fast paced online digital world where those touch points can stack up really quickly, you probably need more than seven. Yeah. But the more you repurpose your content, the more you repromote your content, the sooner you will hit that magic number of whatever it is, seven, eight, nine, however many times. But the simple truth is, you do need to make sure you are touching people with your content on a, on a regular basis. Um, and repurposing it makes it easy, makes that easier. So those seven reasons why we should be repurposing content. Dan, did I see something come in from, from Paul, was it? You certainly did, yeah. So Paul makes two great points. Um, the first is around the word repurpose. Um, unfortunately, Paul didn't offer an alternative, but mentioned that wanky is quite a good word. So if repurpose isn't a good word, at least you know that one of your words is. Um, and then the also, so people leave your audience if you don't keep them fed with content, which again, another great point. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, the Artistics blog this week, which I, I wrote this morning, we talk about um, building audiences in um, 10 ways. Everyone loves a listicle, don't they? 10 ways um, to get people to sign up to your newsletter or to increase the size of your database. Um, and we start that blog by just explaining, well, why do you need to keep building your database? And one of the reasons is, there's some attrition there. There's some, um, your email database gets depleted. Um, and that's partly because people um, just leave it, make change email address, but don't update it. But also because they unsubscribe if they're not getting value from it. Um, so incredibly important that whatever content we put out really does add value to people. It's a great point, Paul. Um, right, um, so those are the seven reasons why you need to repurpose content. Let's have a look at five barriers. The first, hopefully, we've just ticked off, and that's not understanding why it's important. Um, and there were a bunch of occasions in marketing, quote unquote, where actually we need to just dig a bit deeper as to what actually is important. Um, and this is a, this is a good example. Everyone thinks about blogs and content. We've got to keep promote. We've got to keep producing. The more we produce, the better. And that's right to a degree. But as I said earlier, we need to get this balance between content production and content promotion right. And of course, repurposing content is all about the promotion of it. So it's starting to rebalance these things. And very few advisors and planners actually get this balance right. Second, as I said at the start uh, in the introduction, uh, one of the barriers is that people see completion of the content as the end of the race. Whereas it's not, it's just a pit stop along the way. Um, it's literally a pit stop on the way to the end of the race. So you've got to be thinking, right, now I've got my content, what do I do with it? Or ideally be thinking about those two things in parallel. But certainly con the production of the content is not the end of the race. Number three, I know there's plenty of advisors and planners out there, and some may be on this call, who are sh a bit shy, a bit timid, and a bit worried about them being seen as promoting themselves too much or over promotion, over exposure. Um, and I think that's something we've kind of got to try and put a pin in because if you are not uh, promoting yourself, nobody else is going to do it for you. And one of the things we do need to remember is that the advisors, the planners, the mortgage brokers, on this call. There are prospects out there, there are people out there, there's consumers out there who will be better off financially, have a greater sense of financial well-being after working with you. 
Therefore, the more you promote yourself, the more good you will do by helping these people. It's just it's a slight change of mindset, but it's really important. The better you are at promoting yourself, the more people will have financial well-being. The more people will have a better financial future. The more people will feel confident about their financial future. So for me, you have an obligation to be promoting what you do. Um, and as I say, remember that nobody else is going to promote you. You've got to do it yourself. Um, there's a fantastic blog um, that we'll put in the, the follow-up um, about, um, it's not one we wrote, it's somebody else, about um, why people shouldn't be afraid of self-promotion. Um, I'll look it up and I'll get Abby to put it in uh, in the follow-up. I recommend reading that. Um, and then you have some people who worry about repeating messages. They worry about the fact that, oh, am I flooding LinkedIn? Am I doing too much? No, that one post a week you're putting up is not going to flood anybody's timeline. Yeah, um, And they should, we should be posting on a regular basis on our social channels, for example. We have some people who worry about I don't want to overload people with newsletters. I'm going to send them once a quarter. Well, again, that doesn't, that doesn't work. It's just really important because not everybody sees your messages. Um, not everybody reads every article. Not everybody reads every social post. But we've got to keep repeating those messages. Um, and then finding the time. I do completely understand that. Um, it isn't easy to find the time to be marketing your business, promoting yourself, producing content, promoting it, et cetera. So the number numbers one to four, um, there is a certain uh, illogicalness that we can uh, defeat. Finding time, I can't necessarily find time in your diary, other than, of course, you could outsource it to your friendly marketing agency that specializes in financial services. Um, but those are the five, five barriers. So we've talked about the seven reasons to do it. We've talked about some of the barriers. Dan, what's coming on the chat? So Paul sums it up really well by saying, if people won't be better off by knowing about your proposition, then you have a problem with your proposition. So promote it. Yeah, absolutely. 100%, 100% agree. Um, you really do need to be, uh, you really do need to be promoting your own work because nobody else is going to do it, do it for you. Right, how to choose the content you're going to repurpose. So if you have produced blogs on a regular basis, for example, how do you choose which one you're going to uh, repurpose? You're gonna apply some of these 13 ideas to. Um, for me, you've got to take a data-driven approach. And there are three key sources of data that you can draw upon to decide which of your blogs you are going to uh, repurpose and re-promote. Um, so the first is your newsletter open and click-through rates. Um, so most uh, of you who send newsletters uh, will probably outsource to an agency such as ourselves. And we're gonna explain a little bit about how we do that in a second. Um, but we provide all our clients to take Yardstick membership, which is our newsletter and blogging service really detailed analytics uh, to show you open rates, click uh, through rates, which were the most popular articles. Um, so use that data to help decide which of your blogs you should repurpose. Um, and if you don't use Yardstick, then you'll use, if you're using MailChimp or Constant Contact or something like that, there'll be, or HubSpot, there'll be data in the back end that will help you understand which are the most popular newsletters and which are the most popular blogs. And by the way, this is a, a good reason why, if anybody on the call is still doing it, you shouldn't be sending your newsletters via Outlook or Gmail. Um, it's completely untrackable. You don't get any data at all um, as to what people are opening, what people are clicking, what people are interested in. Um, so make sure you've got the data in the first place, then you analyze it. Second source, Google Analytics. Um, so if you go into the, if you're in the current version of analytics, I know it's changing for next year, but if you're in the current version of analytics um, and you want to understand which of your blogs are most popular, on the left-hand side, go into the behavior tab um, 
maybe set the date range for a relatively long period of time, maybe the last nine or 12 months, year to date, something like that. Um, and then look down the list. And it will show you which are the popular pages on your website. Um, and it will show you in there, of course, blogs. Um, you'll see punctuated amongst all the other pages, your blogs. So you can start to look at which are the most popular. And also it shows the average read time. So how long people are spending on average on each of your blogs. Um, so you can start to see which are popular and which are getting good read times. Um, and that will start to help along with your newsletter open rates, uh, help you understand which are the most popular types of content. And it's those you should be repurposing. And then on social media, uh, what would you be looking at there? Links clicked, um, likes and comments for promoting different ideas and different types of content. And of course, you've got a couple of things there on social. Um, let's say you put up a, um, a LinkedIn post linked to a blog. Um, the number of likes, clicks, et cetera, that gets will help you understand the popularity of um, that blog. But you might write a social post just with an idea, just with a concept, sharing your work, um, where there isn't actually a link back anywhere. There's no link back to a blog. Um, but even understanding the engagement of that helps. So if you've written a relatively short post on a topic um, and it's got a bunch of comments and a bunch of likes, then that's telling you you can repurpose that social post into a longer blog post or a guide or a white paper. So a lot of the time on social, um, you should be flying kites. We've been seeing over the past few days, haven't we, uh, various newspaper headlines with government flying kites about what might get announced tomorrow. Um, do we freeze this uh, allowance? Do we push this tax rate up, et cetera? And they'll be making decisions partly on the feedback um, from those kites they're flying in the press. Well, the same applies with your social. Uh, fly kites, come up with ideas, concepts, put them on social. If they fly, if people like them, people engage with them, and that's telling you you could turn that post into a longer form, form content as well. Um, but in terms of the, the blogs, as I say, take a data-driven approach, look at your newsletter stats, look at your Google Analytics, and look at your social engagement. Um, and that will tell you about certain types of con the content you should be repurposing. The other thing I would have is evergreen content. So this is content that um, you're not necessarily looking behind the data on, but you've got it ready to react to events. So for example, um, you might have, every so often, um, there are headlines about stock market volatility. Stock markets rising, stock markets falling by a significant amount over a short period of time. So why not have some evergreen content that you can repurpose for those events? You've got the content it's on the shelf, you pull it down and use it when certain things um, so you could, for example, have an evergreen blog about inflation um, and what to do, the, the steps people should be taking to mitigate the current levels of inflation. Um, and today, you would have pulled that piece down off your electronic shelf and started posting about it because about 8 a.m. this morning, there was the new inflation rate numbers announced. So another way of repurposing content is to have evergreen content that you use you pull down from your digital shelf as and when you need it and events dictate it. Um, as I say, stock market volatility, inflation, two that spring to mind right now. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of which articles you should be looking to repurpose. But of course, you've got to get the articles in the first place, haven't you? Um, and you could write them yourself. You absolutely could write these yourself. The other thing you could do though, is you could outsource them. Um, and this is the perfect moment for a 30 second commercial break, um, explaining Yardstick membership. So I think this is probably the first time we've done this this year. Um, so Yardstick membership is our newsletter and blogging service. Um, there are two versions, uh, syndicated, where we write 22 articles in the month, um, and you, as the advisor or planner who's taking the Arctic membership, chooses which six you want. Um, and there's Bespoke, where we write three articles exclusively for you. 
um, based on a brief we give you or a brief you give us or a brief we collaboratively pull together. So two versions, syndicated and bespoke. Um, we add the articles to your website um, and then we build and send a newsletter. There's a range of frequency options. We would always recommend monthly, but um, just be simply because if you're adding value by sending your newsletter, why, do, why not do it 12 times a year? Yeah, um, it just makes more sense to add value 12 times than four times if you're doing quarterly. We then provide you with actionable management information. Um, and um, that shows open rates, click to open rates, et cetera. Um, and then we uh, provide uh, a monthly guide. Um, and that guide is more in depth. Um, it's probably about two and a half thousand words long and deals with a range of um, topics. Um, some are lifestyle. Um, so this month we did, what did we do, Danny? Was it Christmas markets? Was it five, 10 Christmas markets in Europe? So the, the European Christmas markets was um, previous and the one that's coming out early December is all about um, New Year's resolutions and how they link with your finances. So plenty of actionable tips within Excellent. that one. And mm. we will occasionally get guest, uh, guest bloggers in as well. So I think it was October. We had Chris Budd, um, who is... Someone described Chris the other day to me as the godfather of financial well-being. Um, he's certainly the founder of the Institute now of uh, financial well-being. Um, and we had um, him write a guest blog for us about financial well-being. Um, and obviously that was made available as well. That was the most popular guide we've ever done. Um, and what we do with those guides, we ask you each month if you want it. Uh, and then if you do, we brand it up, put your contact details on put your colours on, add it onto your website and put it into your newsletter as well. So if you're not producing your content yourself and you would like to learn more about the Arctic membership, uh, just stick your email address in the uh, chat and we'll follow up. Abby or I will follow up. Um, Dan, did I see something come through on the chat before we move on to our 13 ways? Yeah, a comment from Rachel um, who says, loves the analogy of the digital shelf, shows the importance of working smarter, not harder. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's, it's about having that evergreen content that, as I say, you can pull down as and when you need it. So you're not having to, you're not having to write it uh, every, every time. The question from Danny. Yeah, uh, great question from Danny. How do syndicated articles affect SEO if posted on multiple companies' blog sections of websites? Um, in our experience, they don't, Danny. Um, they won't have a positive impact on your SEO, um, but um, as, as bespoke content will do. But in our experience, we don't see, uh, there's, we've been doing it for six years now, we don't see any issues there. Um, and if you are worried about it, you can put certain tags on there. So Google disregards it as well. Um, so there's, there's an obvious way around it if you are concerned, but we don't see any issues with that. Right, so 13 ways, 13 ways you can turn your blogs into other content. A few things to, to get out of the way up front. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and therefore, think strategically. I wouldn't try and dive in and do all these 13 things at the same time. Um, pick two, three ideas that you can do consistently. Do them on a regular basis. Um, and I've often said the superpower of great marketers is consistency, just doing it time after time after time. Um, not getting distracted by shiny new things, not getting put off when something doesn't work, just being consistent, it genuinely works. Monitor the results, we've talked about those three things that you can be monitoring, newsletter engagement, Google Analytics, and social engagement, and then make evidence-led decisions uh, about the two or three of these tactics that you've chosen. So let's dive in. Number one, newsletter. And content should be distributed in a newsletter. Email is the shortest communication, the shortest distance when it comes to communication between your mouth and somebody's ear. And, and there are multiple stories about blogging being dead, newsletters being dead, etc. They come around with the frequency that pension tax relief is being cut. 
um, which normally happens around, around now autumn statement budget time. Um, but there's no point just uploading a blog to your website and then just sitting back and expecting people to show up because they won't. So really important that your content is distributed electronically in a newsletter to clients, prospects, and professional connections. And say, we've written that blog about uh, 10 ways to increase your newsletter audience. That'll be out Friday. So again, if anybody's on not on our newsletter list that wants that, just put your name in the chat and we'll sort that out for you as well. And then finally, send newsletters monthly. Quarterly is just not enough. It looks as though you are starting again every time you send it out. It becomes a bit of a surprise. Whereas sending monthly, you're, the people receiving it get into a bit of a rhythm. They're expecting to receive it. Um, I would imagine, I'm not prepared to try it, but I would imagine if we didn't send our newsletter at 7.30 on a Friday morning, we'd get a few messages back saying, where is it this week? Um, I can think of a couple of advisors where um, they may even be on this call. Um, where I can set my clock for the time and day that I will get their newsletter. Um, Graham at Growwiser is a brilliant example of this. Um, he sends his newsletter at 11 a.m. on a Friday morning, um, and it pings in so consistently. Andrew Nelligan at Nelligan Financial is another really good example. Um, he sent his on a Monday. I've noticed he's moved it to a Saturday morning now, I think. Uh, but again, it comes in religiously. Um, and that regularity not only are you adding value more frequently but that regularity that consistency breeds confidence in clients it really does just the fact that you're doing it on a regular basis shows you are the type of person who thinks that consistency and delivery is important so first thing in terms of your content and repurposing it and we're talking about repurposing blogs of course don't just put them on your website and expect people to find them get out there Push it out in an electronic newsletter. Number two, social posts. So you've got your blog. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about quite a lot is listicle style blogs. So the blog we've got coming out this Friday about 10 ways to uh, get more people to sign up to your newsletter. That's a listicle style blog. There's an introduction, there's a call to action at the end, and there's a list, 10 points. This is a listicle style webinar. There's 13 points. Um, we did seven points earlier, five then 13. So people love lists and they're a lot easier to write as well because you know when you've finished. Um, but listicle style blogs, there's all sorts of things you can do with them. Um, you could chop them up into a series of posts. So that uh, blog this Friday, 10 ways to get people to sign up to your newsletter. I could post it as one, um, go and read this. Or I could chop it up over the course of 10 days or 10 posts. Here's, post number, here's idea number one, go and read the blog for the other nine. Here's idea number, idea number two, go and read the blog for the other, the other nine. So those listicle style blogs are an absolute gift for social posts uh, because one 10 point listicle is probably a dozen social posts. Um, Creating a slideshow on LinkedIn. Um, Abby, who's on the call, our head of uh, social media, does this brilliantly. Um, and um, you can just scroll through. Um, I think they're PDFs, aren't they, Abby, that you can just scroll, scroll through. And they look brilliant. Um, there are a few people using them on the LinkedIn, but they're still not massively popular. Um, so creating a little slideshow on LinkedIn, uh, which is a PDF. Um, again, another great way of repurposing um, a listicle style blog into a social post. Um, and then if you've got a blog which has got a lot of data or statistics, um, especially if there's maybe a blog around the cost of living, around inflation or interest rates, creating graphics I think is really important. Um, because we all know that images on social posts help drive engagement. Um, we all know that if you put an image on a post, more people will see it, more people will pause and look at it. Um, so if you could turn uh, some of the data and stats that are in a blog into that image and then link back to the original post, again, I think that's a good thing to be, to be doing as well. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do 
especially on LinkedIn with your blogs, to turn that blog into more engaging social posts. Um, and it doesn't stop there on social. We can, um, on Twitter, moving over to Twitter, which is beloved of, of many advisors. Um, I'm not overly convinced about the benefits in a B2C world. Um, I think Facebook and LinkedIn, potentially Instagram is a, a, a better place, is better hunting grounds. But a, a Twitter thread, uh, again, if you've got a blog, you could cut it down and turn it into a, a Twitter thread. Um, so you've got a thousand word blog, edit it down into a shorter, shorter piece, um, and then upload it to Twitter as a thread. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things you can, you can do there. Uh, but threads are, who knows what happened, Mr. Musk will do to Twitter um, that he's not done over the past couple of weeks. He could do anything, couldn't he? Um, but Twitter threads, again, you could turn blogs into, into threads. Um, and then staying with uh, social and looking at LinkedIn, um, then we could put um, the most popular blogs, all those timely blogs that you pull down from your digital shelf, on LinkedIn as articles. And um, for me, we probably focus, I'm guilty of this, I focus a lot on posts on LinkedIn and really try and post at least once a day. But I don't really think about posting longer form articles on LinkedIn. Um, and that's probably wrong of me. Um, so maybe something to, to look at and doing more, more of. Um, but using a blog that's on your website and putting it up as, a, as an article on LinkedIn, I really think is, a, is an opportunity that I'm missing and other people will do as well. Um, and that's a really good example, again, of maybe some of the evergreen stuff that you could do. Um, it's inflation numbers today. Right, here's our, late, here's our article, our A to Z of how to combat the effects of inflation. Um, there'll be an interest rate announcement soon, I'm sure, as well. Um, so here's our blog on what interest rate rises mean for savers. Here's our blog on what interest rate rises mean for, for mortgage brokers, for mortgage uh, holders. Um, and you're not rewriting it every time. You might tweet one or two bits, uh, but you're not rewriting every time. You're repurposing content that you've already, already got. Um, and then you put, uh, you put the post up, put the article up, I should say, not the post. Um, you might want to link back to the original blog on your website. And then, of course, don't forget, again, write posts to promote the article. So if you've used the blog, you put it on as an article on LinkedIn, you've still got to promote it as well. But I do think articles on LinkedIn are overlooked, certainly by me uh, and potentially by other people as well. Number five, video. Um, so we've all got a studio in our pocket. Oh, we've got, got this. We've got a ring light up here. Um, we can, we've, we've all got these things. Um, and it's very easy to turn a blog into a script. Um, so you could turn, uh, as I say, the blog into a script and record it as a, as a longer video. I would suggest that you probably, probably 100, 20 to 150 words is a minute of a minute of video, something something like that. Um, so if you've got a thousand word blog, you're turning that into a video of maybe eight minutes. Um, and that's okay, that's fine. Some people will engage with that longer form video. Um, but others won't want to give you a full eight minutes of their life. It's quite a long time. Um, so cut it up into shorter videos. And this is where listicle style blogs really come into their own. So again, you've got the 10 things. Um, record a short video for point number one, short video for point number two, and so on. And then post those on social over the course of 10 days. We'll do one in the morning, one in the evening, the course of five days, if you've got 10 things on your list, which apparently is the best number to have. Um, so you could, as I say, create a long video, you could create a short video. One of the things I would do though, is once you've created those videos, embed them into the original blog on your website, because people will read the blog, but if you offer them the video at the top or the video halfway down or those shorter clips for each of the, each of the 10 bullet points on the listing, um, they might engage with the videos rather than the text where they have, might have jumped off the text because they've had enough of reading, they might prefer to move to the videos. So once you've created the videos, not only do you need to promote them on social and in the newsletters, but put them on the original blog as well. 
Uh, podcasts. Um, so I don't know if anybody has got a podcast on here. Uh, by all means, just shout up in the chat if you've got a podcast. I'd be really interested to understand how that's going. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, I think is really good about podcasts these days is they don't have to be infinite. You could do a series. Um, so you could do a box set of podcasts, maybe half a dozen, maybe, maybe six. Um, and take your six most popular blogs and turn them into a podcast series. Again, take that listicle blog and turn it into, into a podcast or a series of podcasts. If you've got a listicle blog of, I don't know, 10 points that's been really popular, then do a, a box set of 10 short podcasts explaining each of those points in more detail. So you're using your blog as inspiration there for a script for a podcast. Um, but the podcast is a box set. Um, and again, I think that could be incredibly popular as well. Podcasts might make people nervous, but they are more accessible than they used to be. Dan, did I see something come up in the chat? Yeah, you certainly did. So Rachel asks a great question. Is there an argument for the podcast space now being oversaturated, particularly post-pandemic? I'm on the fence about starting one, and this is a concern of mine. Um, I genuinely don't know. Um, what I do know is more and more of us are listening to podcasts. Um, the, I did some research on this. The, actually, the, whilst the audience that engages and listens to podcasts is clearly a younger audience, there's still a significant bunch of people that are kind of 55 plus who are engaging with, with podcasts. Um, and I suspect my hypothesis would be try it um, and see how it goes. It's relatively cost effective. Um, so I'll try and avoid the word cheap. It's, it's really quite cheap to do a podcast. Um, so I would try it, maybe do a series of six and see how that goes. Uh, but again, it's about the balance between content production and content promotion. There is no point producing if you're not going to promote. Um, and then the last thing I'd say on this is I get why there's maybe a gut feeling that the market is saturated and there are a lot of podcasts out there about money, about fi personal finance, et cetera. And I think that's because we're in this bubble. All of us are in this bubble. And we see some really high profile advisors promoting their podcast. Pete Matthew started this years ago. And I don't necessarily think that that means it's, it is oversaturated. It might feel like it's oversaturated. Sorry, long-winded and rambling answer, but hopefully that helps. Dan, anything else? No, that's it. And I think to uh, Paul agrees as well. Um, so Paul says it's very busy, um, but quality matters, um, and they're considering it too. Um, but just to give it some context, I mean, I listen to a lot of design podcasts, um, which no surprise there, but, and it is a completely oversaturated space, but the minute a new design podcast gets published that I've not heard of before, you know, I'm going to check that out, <laughs> you know, and that might creep onto my most commonly listened to podcasts and re perhaps replace one that I've listened to for years. So yeah, zero people listening to the one that you didn't make. So give it a go. Design on a podcast which is yeah there's a big thing where designers are just interviewing each other and talking about things and yeah you'd think it'd be a completely visual thing but it translates surprisingly well interesting mm. um, so for me i would dive in and give it give it a go um, if you can find a different angle great um completely agree uh about um about paul's point um but i do think and actually to be fair i, I agree with paul's point and just to provide some evidence for that um you would probably think that the podcasts aimed at advisors and planners are oversaturated. Um, but Alan Smith, Nick Lincoln, um, and a couple of others have recently launched a, a new podcast. Um, and that's flying. Um, so that shows if you get the quality right and you get the promotion right, actually podcasts can really work well. Number seven, number seven, um, longer form content. So if you've got a really popular blog, that's maybe a thousand words long, that's got a read time of seven, eight minutes, and is the second or third most popular blog on your website over a period of time. That's telling you that people are interested in it. The read time is telling you that people are happy to commit time to reading it as well. So go deeper, turn that blog into a longer white paper 
or the guide um, by expanding the text, going deeper, putting more detail in there. You could even get to the point where you combine um, similar a blogs on a similar topic into a book, whether that's physical or electronic. Um, and it's easier than people think to create this type of stuff, to create, um, uh, turn blogs into white papers, guys, turn it into longer format, even to the point of, of books. Um, and if you can get to the point of releasing and promoting a book, it is incredibly powerful at demonstrating your domain expertise. It genuinely is. I don't know if anybody on here has produced a book. Uh, Noel, if you're around, you've done a book, haven't you? I saw your name on the, the list. Um, I'd be really interested to see how that, that went. Uh, but if you've got blog, the blog or blogs on a topic, then that's the starting point. And it's relatively straightforward to take it into longer form content. And then moving into the, the visual, um, as we said before, not everybody consumes content in the same way. Not everybody wants to read blogs. But your blog is obviously the starting point for a lot of this. And we've talked about turning your blogs into videos. But why not turn your blogs into infographics? Um, and that's because we all consume information in different ways. And that visual graphic, whether it's um, on your website or used on social, um, will capture the eye um, and is something that's a bit different. Um, infographics were incredibly popular a few years ago. You see fewer of them now. Um, and therefore, uh, you will stand out more by creating that sort of thing. Um, it works best where you have uh, blogs that are data heavy, yeah, because data works really well in infographics, uh, words slightly less well. Uh, but consider if you've got data heavy blogs, consider turning them into infographics. Dan, did I see something come in the chat? Yeah, so Alex mentions that longer form video podcasts can also be repurposed into shorter clips to share on social with potential for more shareability. Um, which we're absolutely in agreement with, especially Abby on the call with the History Film Club podcast. Um, so yeah, snip those uh, longer videos up and uh, give people a teaser to get them to listen to the whole thing. And again, great point. And there's a lot of kind of virtuous circles going on here, isn't there? Um, you you write the listicle, you write the listicle blog, that becomes a series of social posts. Um, each of those social posts will have different engagement levels. That'll tell you which of which of those ten really resonated. The the, the one that resonates the most, you could then turn into a podcast. There's there's so many um, different trigger points and and virtuous circles here that we can take advantage of. Um, so number nine, webinars. Now, whenever I say webinars to advisors, there's often a bit of an advisor shaped hole in the wall, like a cartoon character from years ago. Um, Whereas there seems to be a lot of pop, a lot of enthusiasm for podcasts, less enthusiasm for webinar, um, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. Maybe it's because a webinar is live and a podcast isn't. Um, but for me, webinars are an incredibly important rung on that value ladder, um, and two reasons really. It allows you to communicate with a relatively a relatively large audience. So we've had 128 people sign up for this webinar um, and it lasts an hour. That's a lot of time um, that I've been able to efficiently use um, along with, with Dan and Abby. So it works efficiently from you. It allows people who attend the webinar to hopefully get value. You'll be the judge of that in this case. Um, but it also acts as a filter. So you've got your audience. Let's say you've got 1,000 people on your data. Um, and then let's say 30 people sign up for the webinar and 20 people sign up. You're slowly filtering that initial audience down into the people that are really serious. So if you run a webinar, um, and of course, the whole purpose of this is to use your blogs to create the webinar, um, you're filtering down your initial audience to those people who are interested and those people who are interested enough to turn up. And then, of course, those people who turn up should be then getting a phone call from you to try and move the uh, relationship, if they're not already a client, from prospect to clients. So as we're saying here, those webinars should be used to inform existing clients 
um, and engage and filter those prospects. Um, and your blogs would be used to produce the invite, the presentation, and the scripts. Um, imagine you've got that, ten, that, that block, 10 things to do when interest rates rise, five for savers, five for mortgage holders. Um, that's a really easy webinar to write once you've got the blog. So tick, really straightforward. Really easy to write the invite once you've got the blog because you can explain what the webinar is about, the benefit of attending, et cetera. Um, then pull it down from your digital shelf. So interest rates, Bank of England meets on a Thursday. Interest rates rise. That evening, send out a mailer to your database. Right, we'll be online at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Yeah, you've already got your, your invite written, your email written, your script and your presentation. React really quickly yeah, because you've got that asset already. Um, I'm just not seeing people do it. And I think that having that immediacy is really, really important. Um, we've got, uh, it's the autumn statement tomorrow. Uh, the team are in the office tomorrow. Um, I think it happens around lunchtime. Our aim, which we will hit, is to have all the updates out on behalf of our clients to their clients by the 6 a.m. news because that immediacy is so important. So webinars, um, turning blogs into scripts and presentations, I think is a really useful way of repurposing your blog content. It's easier than you think, really low cost. And the other thing, we've got another one of these loops here as well, because the questions that people ask on the webinar then become future content. So Danny, you asked a question earlier, um, about um, the SEO impact on uh, of syndicated content. Right, I can write a blog about that. I can write a social post about that. Um, I can write a social post about that idea about the digital, um, the digital bookshelf went down well earlier. I can write a social post or a blog about that. So those delegate questions are really, really important because they are your future content. So we've got another one of these loops here. Right, closing in on the uh, on number 13. So press releases. Journalists always want interesting stories. Um, there's two ways to get into press. You can react um, and something like news page from Dominic Heyer and his team is just brilliant for doing that. Um, but journalists, once you've got a relationship with them, if you can go to them with stories, even better. Um, and they love well-researched, data-driven um, press releases, data-driven information. Ideally, it should be your own research. They're not going to regurgitate someone else's research on your behalf. Um, but if you've written a really interesting blog, perhaps based on some research you've done with your clients um, or research you've done with a wider audience, um, and you've written that into a blog, journalists will be interested and potentially pick up on that. Number 11, for engaging with uh, professional connections and by extension, their clients. So professional connections, accountants and solicitors, they're generally really poor marketers, really poor. Um, and again, they suffer with the same issues that uh, advisors and planners do when it comes to content production and content promotion. Um, so why not offer um, some of your professional connections blogs? Yeah, it's very easy. If we've done that data-driven research, you will know which are the most popular blogs, go to them and say, we've done this research, most popular blogs on our website over the past 12 months were these three. Um, how about we put those into your newsletter? Um, ideally, of course, with a link back to your website. So just expand your audience again, not just your audience, but piggyback other people's audience as, as well. And if they run podcasts or webinars, ask to go on as a guest to discuss particular topics. Um, and again, you can use the blogs as inspiration there. So, Mr. Accountant, Mrs. Solicitor, these were the three most popular blogs on our website. I see you do a podcast. Or how about doing a, doing a joint webinar together? Or can I come and speak at your event? Yeah, you're not just putting your hand up and saying, can I come and speak? You are going to them with um, an idea. And it's a data-driven idea because you've shown them what's popular. 
So use your blogs to engage with professional connections. And as I say, by extension with their clients. Number 12, um, a welcome email after your newsletter sign up. So if anybody signs up to the Yardstick newsletter, um, as nine and a half thousand people have, um, they get a uh, welcome uh, email when they, when they sign up. Um, it's an autoresponder, so it happens automatically. We don't have to think about it. Um, and it includes a range of our most popular blogs. Um, so combine idea number 12 with the blog that we're going to send out on Friday. Um, and you're onto a bit of a winner there. Get more people sign up to your newsletter. When they do, they get the autoresponder with the most popular blogs. And then each month, they then get a further set of blogs from you to go and, to go and read. And then number 13, include your most popular blogs in nurturing sequences. So um, lead magnets where people download a guide and in return get that guide, you get their data. Put your most popular blogs in your nurturing sequences. So they shouldn't just hear off you once, they should hear off you uh, maybe once a week for the first four weeks and then go into your newsletter system. Um, well, you know, if you've done the research, which are the most popular blogs and therefore use those popular blogs in your nurturing sequence after someone has downloaded a lead magnet. And the same would apply to an online scorecard. Um, online scorecards are incredibly popular right now. Um, I suspect they're a bit of a shiny new thing in some cases um, that people leap into doing, think all the spend all the time thinking about the scorecard and no time thinking about promoting it. And we might do a webinar next year on how to promote scorecards. Um, but if someone's completed a scorecard, then using those popular blogs to add more value, walk them up the value ladder, really, really important. So those are the 13. Baker's dozen or unlucky for some, depending on your point of view. Um, pick the ones though, that actually you can action and you can do consistently. As I said before, just because you should doesn't mean that you, just because you could doesn't mean you should go the right way around. So pick two or three that you can do consistently and, and keep, keep doing them. Hope that's been useful. We'll do some questions in a minute because I've seen a couple come in. Um, but that's it for our webinar series for 2022. Um, I hope you found them useful. Um, we've done them every month um, and we've done, we've added workshops in this year as well. So paid for workshops um, and we'll be back in January uh, with uh, a webinar once a month um, and then paid for workshops on a regular basis. Because we've been trialing that this year with our referral and recommendation workshop. That's gone well. Um, so we're going to be doing more of that next year. We do need your help though. So if there are topics you want us to cover, um, then please do let us know. Um, we're going to do a, another little survey in December. Did one in the middle of the year. We're going to do another one in December to try and understand uh, what it is that you guys want us to be talking about on webinars, where you'd like us to spend our time. So we'll do that survey. But in the meantime, if there is anything that you would like us to be doing, um, then drop me an email, bill at the yardstickagency.co.uk. Or go onto LinkedIn, look me up, send me a connection request um, if we're not already connected, um, and tell us what you would like to see us do more of next year. Because we want to make sure that you get out of these sessions exactly what you want to, and you leave with your questions answered, uh, which is a lovely segue into that. Dan, what questions have we got? Okay, so uh, first two questions are around the scorecard. So Danny asks, can you explain what a scorecard is? And Chris says, have you got a generic guide on easy ways to create a scorecard? Right. Uh, I don't have a generic guide on easy ways to create a scorecard, but I can recommend. So uh, scorecard software um, kind of begins and ends with Score App, which is um, a Daniel Priestley creation. Um, so Daniel wrote uh, unsubscribe, oversubscribed, not unsubscribed, oversubscribed, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and Score App is a business uh, from Daniel Priestley's stable. So I go and have a look at that. Um, and Daniel has written a book 
Um, it's available free if you find the right landing page um, or just send him a, a message on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and it is the A to Z of writing scorecards. Um, I got my copy delivered this week. Um, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I had a flick through it last night. It looks incredibly comprehensive and incredibly useful. So that's what I would do. I'll do that, Chris. Um, Danny, a scorecard is essentially an online, it's an online quiz. Um, so scorecard is one of those uh, marketing terms that I so described earlier, but it's an online quiz. Um, and it might be 15 questions to understand if you are retirement ready. Um, so you'd have groups of questions um, someone would uh, answer those questions. Ideally, they're really quick fire. You're not having to go off and research and look up the information. Um, and at the end of it, you get a score, hence the name scorecard. Um, and you are, Dan, you are 60% retirement ready. But Abby's 70% retirement ready. Abby's better than you. Um, but what you're then doing, so you're giving somebody an idea of how ready they are in this case for retirement, but then you give them further reading. So, Dan, you... Um, your shortfalls with understanding your state pension um, and estate planning. Here's a blog about estate planning. Here's a blog um, about, um, about uh, state, state pension and one about estate planning. Um, where you can have further reading, you can start to learn more. And the idea is, of course, Danny, that you're getting not only the contact information of the person who's completed it, but a whole load of other information as well that allows you to more effectively follow up with the prospect. So it's a bit of fun, it's a bit of value, it engages people, you get data uh, that you can then follow up. Brilliant. And uh, Sholpan very helpfully uh, follows that up by recommending a recent uh, Brett Davidson webinar um, that mentions that too for the, um, the recent PFS stuff. Um, so there's plenty of things that you can uh, get more info about those scorecards there. Okay, so a question in from Ronald, who asks if we can provide a list of our paid for workshops for 2023. Ronald, we absolutely can when we've built that list. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to send out a little questionnaire um, over the next couple of weeks, just helping um, us understand what actually people want. Um, we will be reworking our paid for, all our workshops are paid for, webinars are free. Um, and we're going to rewrite, or I'm in process of rewriting our recommendation workshop. So that will definitely be something for next year. Um, I think um, Abby and I would like to do a LinkedIn workshop as well, help people with LinkedIn. Um, so there is a bunch of stuff that we will be doing on paid for workshops uh, and webinars, but we just want to take our cue from all the people that have attended webinars this year. Hence, we'll send out the, the, the quiz, the survey, um, and we'll react to that, but it will be out soon, Ronald. Brilliant. I believe that was, no, I spoke too soon. Um, one final question. Uh, will workshops be for advisors or marketeers? Uh, both, Danny. Um, so anybody who's, the, as we say on the invites, um, the workshops are generally aimed at, um, and as the webinars, anybody who's got a responsibility for marketing within the business whether that's advisors, planners, specialist marketing execs and managers, or anybody that just put their hand up and said, I'll do the marketing in the business, it's quite often. Happens. So uh, the more the merrier, um, and, but they'll all be aimed at uh, people who have responsibility for the marketing. Lovely. Well, all of the other comments are people wishing us a Merry Christmas for when it arrives. And also, um, it looks like you thought you might be able to get away with it. Someone's wished you a happy birthday, Phil. Um, so Aisha has uh, said they've uh, spotted on LinkedIn that it's your birthday. So and there we go. Thank you, Aisha. It, it is. So next year's a really big one. This year's just, yeah. But uh, thank you. Much appreciated. Um, and thank you to everybody for your engagement over the past uh, few months. Uh, we've really enjoyed doing these webinars. Um, hope they add value to you. If it's not too early on the 16th of November to wish you a Merry Christmas, then Merry Christmas. Um, and we'll see you all in January. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye.